Uh, I'm Tom Bever. Uh, I'm at the University of Arizona. I'm a vice director of the Center for Consciousness Studies and the co-organizer of this event this week. Um, I'm glad you all are here. This session is on the topic of inner speech, uh, an intriguing phenomenon that has been with us for a long time as a question, but has received some scientific investigation in recent years. We have three excellent speakers, very uh, interesting in what they do and in the differences between them. Uh, I'll introduce them speaker by speaker. Uh, so I just start with the first, um, Charles Ferniho. He's a neuroscientist and a literary author. He has a PhD uh, and a BA uh, in psychology uh, from Cambridge University. And for a number of years, he's been at Durham University where he is, he now holds a chair. Uh, his main research interest is hard to describe because it's so broad. Uh, he has many facets, uh, including issues uh, in schizophrenia and other emotional maladies. He started to some extent in his current interest in inner speech with a scholarly, a very thorough scholarly work on Vygotsky, whose ideas were well known as uh, starting with ideas about how children talk to themselves and then they listen to what they're saying uh, as guides to their thinking and behavior, which was a big controversy at the time uh, with Piaget. Um, he's, um, I have to say, a complete media person. Uh, he uh, took time off from academic work uh, to become a novelist and to become an expert on various media, uh, appearing on TV and radio shows and so on. It, it, he developed in part an interest in the integrated study of reading and writing um, and looking at the process both as a novelist and as a scientist. Uh, so his definitive work that's the background for today is an entire book entitled The Voices Within uh, and I'm sure an award, book, an award winning book, I should mention, and I'm sure that much of what he's going to say uh, reflects that investigation. Charles. when advertising executive Nick Marshall has a freak accident involving a bathtub, a hairdryer, and copious quantities of red wine. He comes to his senses with an uncanny ability to read other people's minds. And when Nick listens in to people's thoughts, he really is listening in. He hears them talking to themselves in, in words. And this fits with all sorts of other ways of assessing people's inner experience. Introspection, more formal assessments like experience sampling, in interviews point to our inner experience as having a highly verbal quality. Some have gone as far to, as to say that we're at it all the time. For bars, it's a constant of consciousness. 
Now, as Tom uh, pointed out in his very generous introduction, I started out as a developmental psychologist, interested in where this stuff comes from. How do these words get into our heads? What are they doing there? What functions does inner speech serve? And what is it like? What is its phenomenology? And for me, as Tom mentioned, the most useful writings were those of Vygotsky. So what I want to do is give you a very quick introduction to Vygotsky's approach. And I'm going to do that by showing you a little video clip of my own daughter. She was two at the time I took this video. She's now 18 and six foot, nearly six foot tall, reading philosophy at university. Let's see, see what she has to say. I got my turn I got my turn with me. What am I doing? I got my turn and put home car on it. And the home car on it. On it. And it. turn tap put home car on it. So who is my daughter Athena talking to? Anybody? Another self, an imaginary friend. She's not talking to me, except right at the very beginning. She uses my name. So when we're coding this kind of data, we would code that first utterance, I'm going to make a train track, Daddy. She uses my name, she invokes me. We code that as a bit of social speech. But everything else, she says, we would code as private speech. I could have jumped on a spaceship and flown to Mars, and she would still be doing this, most likely. She's also using language for all sorts of interesting functions. She's using it in a self-regulatory way. She's controlling, regulating her own behavior. She's also expressing emotions. And this little clip that I've picked out has another interesting quality. It emphasizes the dialogic quality of this kind of talk, and I'm going to focus on that in, in what follows. So what is Vygotsky's approach to this? It's a really nice, simple theory. Vygotsky argues that we start off as babies, as social beings engaged in interactions, social interactions from the very first days of life. They're initially gestural and, express, and emotionally expressive. They become linguistic when language kicks in. And that leads to a phase no, known as private speech, which is where children will talk to themselves as they're going about a task, as they're playing, as they're working on a cognitive uh, challenge or puzzle, and so on. And then the third stage in the process is that that private speech becomes inter internalized completely and becomes silent. So that becomes the stuff that goes on, goes on silently in our heads when we're going about our business. At each step of the way, there are these processes of internalization. The, bit, the, the clip that you just saw of Athena was an example of private speech. If we'd been able to listen into her thoughts 10 years later, perhaps she would have been doing all of that in inner speech, most likely. Another important point is that for Vygotsky, language changes as it becomes internalized, and there are processes of syntactic and semantic abbreviation in particular that go on. So when you heard Athena say to herself, I need some cars, she responds to her, her own utterance in this dialogic way, but she doesn't say, I need some, car, I need, um, some cars for my train track, or I need two cars for my train track. She just says, two cars. So the utterance is stripped down, it's fragmented, it's abbreviated. These qualities of private speech should also carry on into our inner speech. So I've been interested in, in my career um, in certain implications of Vygotsky's theory, which he wasn't able to explore himself um, due to his early, his early death. One is that inner speech should have a dialogic quality. When you're talking to yourself, you really are having a conversation. I think that's a profoundly important idea. Another is that there should be different kinds of inner speech. Inner speech is not just one thing. And that one of the things I focused on is a, a distinction that I've made, really following, just fleshing out what Vygotsky had already written, between what I call expanded inner speech, which is where you're having a full-blown conversation with yourself, 
in full-on sentences and you're saying everything out loud, fully constructed, as you would if you were, probably if you were talking to another person. So that's expanded in a speech. And then there's another variety that I call condensed in a speech, where everything is much more stripped down, telegraphic, compressed, condensed. A bit like that example that we saw of her, her private speech when she said two cars. She didn't say, I need two cars for my train track. So that sort of compression, condensation, I think is a really important thing that flows from Vygotsky's theory. And I've tried to, to flesh it out and spell it out, spell out the implications of it and what I've done. Another key point is that we can move between different kinds of inner and outer speech. We can go from a stage of doing some condensed inner speech, and we can move into expanded inner speech, and we can go in the other direction, and we can fully re-externalize uh, our inner speech as well. We can turn it into private speech and talk to ourselves out loud as adults, just as we used to when we were children. So I want to set out the kind of the first version of the model that, I, that was published in 2004. And what I've done here is really just flip that first diagram round, that Vygotsky diagram round. So we start at the bottom with social speech, we move up through the phase of private speech, and then we've got these two kinds of inner speech, condensed and expanded. And the idea is that we can move flexibly between these kinds of inner speech as conditions change, and particularly in times as uh, the cognitive challenge of the, of the of the uh, events uh, changes. I want to introduce another idea here which um, comes from uh, Vygotsky's student, Luria. And that is the idea of a functional system. A functional system is a system of hierarchically organized cognitive processes that work together in shifting constellations of components. So they are bi there are systems that join together, that work together in hierarchically organized um, structures, but that those structures can change as conditions change. So uh, the constituent elements of a functional system can change, can drop out, can uh, develop over the course of development, or can be affected by uh, trauma, brain injury, and so on. And I want to think about inner speech as a functional system, whereby initially independent neural systems are wired together by social experience. This is a profound idea that Luria set out. He's seen as the father of cognitive neuroscience. He's often seen as the guy who said the prefrontal cortex matures and bang, we're able to do all this um, cool executive stuff. That's not really, that's part of what he said. But for, for Luria, that rewiring of the, of the prefrontal cortex was partly a social phenomenon. It was rewired by social experience. And that gives us a very different perspective on how executive functions develop in childhood. And I've tried to spell this out in, my, in various writings on what I've called the, the dialogic thinking model. OK, I'm going to come back to the idea of functional systems if there's time, just at the end of the talk. How do we go about studying in a speech? Let's get methodological. Now, if I were Mel Gibson, I'd simply be able to peer into the mind of the person next to me, and I'd be able to work out what they're thinking. The one thing I didn't say about this movie, What Women Want, this rather silly Hollywood rom-com from, from the year 2000, Mel can read people's minds, but he can only read women's minds. I'm just going to leave that thought out there for you. <laughs> it was pointed out to me that a much more um, politically correct example would be Suki Stackhouse from True Blood, who also listens into people's thoughts and also hears them talking to themselves. Thinking is a conversation with yourself. But I'm not Suki either, so I need to use some scientific methods. We can look at individual differences in the extent to which people use this kind of speech. We can give people dual task paradigms. And what that means is that you take a task that you think involves inner speech. You then give, a, give the person another task to do, which you think is going to knock out their ability to use language. And you look to see whether their performance on the, on the first task is affected. You can do phenomenological studies. You can give people questionnaires and interviews. You can use more formal kinds of experience sampling. And of course, we've got all the various neuroscientific methods at our disposal now. When I started out in the 1990s, there was very little on this topic. It was really hard to find stuff, apart from some fairly obscure Soviet stuff, which you had to try and read in the Russian. Um, that really has changed in the, in, the, in the course of my career when I reviewed the research for New Scientist a couple of years ago, there was plenty to talk about. 
Um, for ex an example of the kind of method that we use is this is an app we developed which sets, sends an alert and you can set what time it gets sent to you. And it gives you a little a mini questionnaire. This is one of the items from a questionnaire we developed to assess the different qualities of inner speech, different kinds of inner speech that exist. And so here the question is asking, at the time of the alert, I was having a back and forth conversation in my head. We're trying to get at the extent to which that person's inner speech, if they were having it at that moment, had a dialogic or conversational quality. So when my colleague Ben Alderson Day and I reviewed the evidence on inner speech a couple of years ago for Site Bull, we came up with a monster of a paper. There are 37,000 words in it, 250 cited references. People have died reading this paper. <laughs> and that really, I'd mention it just as, a, just as a way of saying that this is an, an area of research that is expanding. There's a lot more to say about inner speech than there was when I started out. I want to change focus slightly now. And I want to talk about another kind of experience which is not as common and which is often seen, which is usually seen, as a sign of severe mental illness. And what I mean here is the, is the experience of auditory verbal hallucinations or hearing voices, an experience that most people will initially associate with a serious uh, mental disorder like schizophrenia. And indeed, about 70% of people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia will hear voices. But so will they in a whole range of other psychiatric diagnoses, everything from bipolar disorder to borderline personality disorder, um, a whole range of stuff, um, a whole range of disorders involve hearing voices. And then beyond psychiatric patients, there is a group of people, a rather small group of people, but they're there, they're significant, probably about 1% of the population who hear voices quite regularly in the absence of any distress. They do not seek psychiatric help, they do not need psychiatric help, they hear voices quite complex, uh, elaborate voices quite regularly. We call these non-clinical voice hearers. And then there's the rest of us, somewhere between 5 and 15% of the regular population will have fairly infrequent, possibly one-off, voice hearing experiences. So a very common one is to hear your name called. In clear consciousness, when you're fully awake, you hear somebody calling your name, you look around, and there's no one there. Quite a lot of us have that kind of experience. Now, what's this got to do with inner speech? Well, this is how I got into this topic in the first place, because people were talking about uh, voice hearing or auditory verbal hallucinations as resulting from a disorder of inner speech. And thankfully, the idea is nice and simple. You, you have an auditory verbal hallucination when you produce some inner speech, but for some reason, you don't recognize that you yourself produced it. So you, you kind of generate some inner speech, but you don't recognize it as your own work. And so you experience it as having come from an external agent. We have quite a nice new neuroscientific theory of how this works. We know language is very, very simply generated in uh, left imperial frontal gyrus or Broca's area. Uh, this is where we generate inner speech. There's a bit of the temporal lobe further back, roughly Wernicke's area, where speech is perceived. And the idea is that in the typical case, when you produce some inner speech, there's a little internal message, a corollary discharge, that is sent from Broca's to Wernicke's area, saying, effectively, don't listen to what you're about to hear, or don't pay too much attention to it, because it's you speaking. You don't need to worry about it, it's you. That's what happens in the typical case. And the idea is that when somebody hears voices, that message doesn't get through. It either doesn't get generated at all, or it's degraded, or it's delayed, or something happens to it. So that internal tip-off doesn't get through. That message to say, don't pay too much attention to this, doesn't get through. And so that bit of inner speech is experienced as an external voice. So I came to this area, having done all this work in developmental psychology, and thought about how Vygotsky had thought about children's inner speech. And I thought, are they talking about the same thing? Are these people in psychiatry talking about the same kind of thing? And yes, they were, but I found that the developmental approach was richer, and it had certain implications for this inner speech model that were well worth exploring. So for example, people talked about inner speech in relation to hearing voices, as if it was just one thing, as if it was only ever one thing. 
And I wanted to say no. I think inner speech is lots of different kinds of things. And what does that mean for the theory? So ideas like the distinctions between expanded and condensed inner speech, monologic and dialogic inner speech. And, and I think we've argued, in fact, that this forces a really fundamental rethink of the neuroimaging findings that we've had, um, so, that we found so far. Now, this is the point where you, where you expect me to start talking about the schizophrenic brain and mental disorder and functional connectivity and so on. I'm not, because I think the best way to talk about the cutting edge science on, the, on auditory verbal hallucinations is to tr take a trip back in time to this rather extraordinary book. Can I have a show of hands if you've heard of Marjorie Kemp? Okay, it's the first time I've done this with a US audience. Similar sorts of responses to what I get in the UK. Not many people have heard of her, and they should have done, because she's a literary giant. She wrote this book, The Book of Marjorie Kemp, which is the first autobiography in the English language. It's the first time anyone, man or woman, had written about their own life in English. And this is it. This is, there is one manuscript of The Book of Marjorie Kemp. This is it in the British Library, and I was lucky enough to... Uh, to see it. This is my own photograph of the, of the manuscript. Why are we interested in Marjorie Kemp right now, apart from the fact that she's a literary giant? She was an extraordinary woman. She, had, uh, she was born to a well-to-do family in Kings Lynn in East Anglia in England. Uh, she was a failed businesswoman. Uh, she had, had 14 children. And at, very, at a certain point in her life, she started to have voice, voices and visions, which she took to have a spiritual significant. So she was a voice hearer who wrote about her experiences. And it's been and useful to me to think about how she writes about her experiences and what that means for our understanding of voice hearing today. So let me tell you about some of Marjorie's experiences. The first time she has an, ex an unusual experience, she wakes up and she looks and sees somebody sitting on the end of her bed. That person is Jesus Christ. And that person says to her, Daughter, why have you forsaken me when I never forsook you? And Christ says this to her in clear external speech, as if there'd been another person there in the room with her. Now, another time, Marjorie has an experience which is auditory, but non-verbal. So here she describes hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit as if it had been a pair of bellows, like the things you use to pump up a fire blowing in her ear. So it's sound, but it's not speech. On another occasion, the voice she hears is auditory, but not human. And then our Lord turned that sound into the voice of a dove. She hears a dove calling, and that is the voice that she hears. That is the experience. And other times, her experience is multisensory, so it's not just acoustic. It has a visual impression as well. So that first time she sees Christ sitting on her bed, he is clad in a mantle or cloak of purple silk, sitting on her bedside. So these experiences are very varied. They're not always a clear external speech coming from outside the head. They come in all shapes and sizes. And in fact, when we did a very large, the largest ever mixed method survey of people's voice hearing experiences um, a couple of years ago, we found just this kind of phenomenal, uh, phenomenal richness. Many people talked about their voices as being associated with sensory feelings in the body, for example, talked about their voices as being somewhere between a voice and a thought. The idea that it's this booming sound from outside sometimes is the case, but definitely not always. Now, I've got very interested in this approach, and I've been thinking a lot about Marjorie Kemp, and I've been thinking about the writings of the people who study her from the perspective of medieval literature. And this guy, Barry Windiat, a fellow of Emmanuel College in Cambridge, is a very eminent medieval literary scholar. And he wrote this thing at the end of one of his articles on Marjorie Kemp that really got me thinking. He argued, it is time to read Marjorie Kemp's inner voices as a projection of her own spiritual understanding of divine interaction with her, and hence as an insight into her own mentality. And this really brought me up short. This really got me thinking differently about inner speech. And to use another phrase of Wendy Atts, what are the cognitive processes involved in a praying mind talking to itself? 
Now, one thing you can understand about Marjorie's experiences is that she is kind of just receiving. She's a receiver, and she's getting some signals from, from somewhere else. Somewhere else is transmitting this signal to her, but that's problematic for me, because you either have to posit a supernatural entity, which I'm agnostic about, but you know, many people would not, want to, would not want to have to posit such a thing, or you actually end up with a kind of biological reductionism. So it's much more fruitful, I think, and this is where Windy Act uh, inspired me, to think about Kemp's experiences as the products of a mind in dialogue. So this is some interdisciplinary work that we've been doing in Durham in our project Hearing the Voice. And Corinne Saunders is my colleague uh, who's an expert in secular medieval literature. And she's helped me to understand um, how to approach this as, as a historical phenomenon. We gave a, 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 a panel in a conference in Oxford, and we, we produced this article together. This is my first medieval studies publication. I'm absolutely thrilled with it. Um, I'd like, those of you who have, make a big thing about impact factors, I'd like to tell you the impact factor of this journal. Zero. <laughs> Point. Zero. Seven. But I'm incredibly proud of this paper. I think it just shows what a nonsense impact factors are. There you are, that's my rant. So let's get back to a praying mind talking to itself. What is going on cognitively when somebody is talking to themselves in the context of prayer? Let's get into some psychology. This is a bit of, an, of a diagram from that psychological bulletin article that Ben and I wrote a couple of years ago. And what we've got here is two important components <clears throat> of inner speech. This, those of you who know the psychology, is basically a kind of badly in hitch phonological working memory system. This is something that is looping around phonological information. It's prob in probably instantiated neurally in terms of some feedback loop between Broca's area and Wernicke's area. It's the thing that happens when you're thinking in words. It's the thing that happens when you're computing phon phonological information silently in your head. But I think you need something more. To get to what Marjorie is experiencing, you need something else. You need this. And this is basically theory of mind or social cognition. To do an internal dialogue, you don't just need to be able to do language. You need to be able to do language in relation to another perspective. A dialogue has to, be a, has to have a, an interplay between different points of view, essentially. And you can't compute different points of view unless you comp compute social cognition. So you need something like a social cognition system for your inner language to plug into to allow you to do inner dialogue. Here's a much simpler way of expressing that. To do inner dialogue, you've got to be able to say something as me, the speaker. You've got to be able to generate some stuff. But you've also got to be able to have a conversation with yourself as an interlocutor, as the person that you are talking to. You've got to have that two-way exchange. You've got to have those two positions within the dialogue. And I'm going to come back to this idea and put some flesh on it in a second. Um, let's get into the brain uh, very briefly. We thought that if in a dialogue really is a dialogue, we should be able to see this stuff unfolding in fMRI. So if we did the first study where we asked people to generate some inner speech, but to do it in two conditions. What we asked people to do, we gave them some scenarios, such as a visit to your old school. In the monologic condition, what you had to do was uh, generate some inner speech that involved giving a speech to your students. So kind of like I'm doing now, I'm chucking out some language and I'm not getting, I'm seeing you all looking attentively, but we're not actually having a dialogue. The dialogic condition is having a conversation with your old head teacher, where there is a to and fro, there is an interaction between the two perspectives. Uh, and we got people doing these two different kinds of inner speech. We looked at the contrast between the monologic and the dialogic condition. We also got people doing some theory of mind tasks with an appropriate control task. And this basically is what we found very, very simply. The blue stuff up here is the difference between dialogic and monologic inner speech. So that seems to be what's special about dialogicality in inner speech. The yellow stuff, the yellow stuff is your theory of mind system. And we're looking at the right hemisphere because this is where the interesting conjunction happened. We're looking for a point where those two things overlap. And that's the green bit. Um, that's the point at which those two systems seem to overlap to produce dialogic inner speech. 
And this is roughly the right TPJ. Those of you who know your neuroscience of social cognition, you'll, you'll know that the TPJ is heavily implicated in thinking about other people's minds. To simplify that very quickly, this is a diagram showing, looking down on the brain from above and behind, this is your left hemisphere in a speech system, and that's your um, right TPJ, which is computing the social cognition aspect that's generating that other perspective that you need in order to do genuine inner dialogue. Let's go back to this diagram again. I said that you've got the me as speaker, generated in inner speech that is interacting with the me as interlocutor. I call this thing the open slot. The reason I call it the open slot is that anything can go into it. I can have a conversation with myself, but I can also have a conversation with, somebody mentioned it earlier, an imaginary friend, a tulpa, um, a fictional character. I can have a conversation with a real person, either alive or dead. I've, I can have a conversation with my mum, thankfully very much alive. Or why not? I can have a conversation with the big guy himself. This is a way of thinking about all these different phenomena that uses the same basic cognitive structure, which we're starting to understand cognitively and neuroscientifically. Let's go back to this diagram here and an important aspect of it, which I didn't mention at the time, which is key to understanding how it might help us to figure out what goes on when people hear voices. The idea is that when people, people who hear voices are doing a lot of condensed inner speech, but every so often, particularly when things become challenging and stressful, that condensed inner speech becomes re-expanded into expanded inner speech. And this is the kind of flashpoint, I've argued, when people start to hear voices. So I want to work in this element of re-expansion just to add another layer to the model before I wrap up. So we're thinking about the transition between condensed inner speech, which can be re-expanded into expanded inner speech. This is what I think is happening with Marjorie Kemp. I think there is a, a time, there's a period of time when she is uh, engaging in condensed inner speech with the deity, with the supernatural figure. But everything is condensed and stripped down and tightly integrated. And this is uh, what I would describe as uh, her meditation and that, her sense of being with her God. When that condensed inner dialogue is re-expanded, God speaks to Marjorie as much more of an external agent. And the exact analogy in the model explaining why people hear voices goes like this. People who hear voices do regular condensed inner dialogue, but when that is re-expanded, they experience an alien, alien or intrusive thought, alien or intrusive voice. Okay, I've given you an, a flavor of the kind of interdisciplinary work that we're doing in Durham, and I just want to wrap up by talking about a couple of the challenges that face us with this kind of research. As far as voice hearing is concerned, there are problems that, like Sean Gallagher has mentioned, the selectivity problem. If inner speech leads to voices, why isn't all inner speech heard as a voice? I think the Vygotskyan model helps us with that. Another issue that is um, important is how auditory heard voices are. Voices, as I've already said, are not always auditory. And we've got to try and make sense of that within an inner speech model. I think we can. Uh, and another important thing is the neglect so far of social cognitive processes in hearing voices. People hear voices as characters, as people, as personalities with important emotional significances for them. And research so far has tended to neglect that. As far as the challenges facing inner speech research are concerned, here's a few. Daniel Gregory has uh, questioned whether inner speech really is dialogic, and he's given a nice account of how the idea of talking to yourself is problematic for, for kind of uh, Anglo-American philosophy of mind traditions, for Gricean ideas about communicative pr principles. My, my view of this is this, this takes us into philosophy and linguistics, and I'd love to, to, to go there, but essentially I think if Grice isn't working, we need to chuck Grice out. Um, Russ Hurlbert will be talking later on today, in fact, about whether inner speech really is condensed, and Russ and I are having a very fruitful conversation, ongoing conversation about this, because in his method of descriptive experience sampling, you don't see a lot of condensation. And my counter to that is that we give these questionnaires, they've been 
used in different countries around the world. They've been validated in lots of different samples. And we do see condensation coming out as a factor in how people describe their inner speech. So that's to, that's to be continued, I think. Augustine Vicente has done some interesting work, just about to come out, if it hasn't already come out, in Naus, um, on understanding, which I think helps us to understand what Vygotsky meant by the semantic transformations as things are internalized. I talked a bit about the syntactic, but the semantic ones need understanding as well. Sam Wilkinson and I have been doing some work on understanding how inner speech works within the predictive processing framework. Some people have proposed that inner speech is just a prediction. I think there are some problems with that idea but it's a fruitful avenue for further research. And Noam Chomsky the other day um, asked us what language is for, um, and with a, presenting a view that language is phylogenetically, at least, about internal communication before it's about social communication. And I think that may very well be true, but it doesn't mean the same thing uh, holds out ontogenetically. In other words, children who have the genetic endowment to do language as they develop, might well start using language for social purposes before they use it for internal purposes. I just want to throw another spanner in the works by talking about some work that Russ and I and colleagues did on, on the methodology of studying in a speech. So we used Russ's Beeper method of descriptive experience sampling in a study that we ran in Berlin. And here's a hideously complex diagram to show the complexity of the two-week uh, experiment. People came along and they learned how to do descriptive experience sampling. And then they did it in their natural environments as they were walking around Berlin. And then they did it again in the scanner. It was the first time anybody had combined this incredibly powerful experience sampling method with fMRI. And all I want you to take from this is the fact that right at the beginning, we asked people to do some standard inner speech tasks in the scanner. In other words, what everybody does when they study inner speech is they stick somebody in the scanner and say, do some inner speech, and by the way, this is what you have to say to yourself. A word, a sentence, something that's constrained. We did that in the usual way. But in this part of the experiment, we were capturing people's inner experience as it happened. And we got a whole load of beeps, a whole load of samples of experience, and then we coded them for whether they involved inner speech or not. So we had a contrast, we had the standard you're doing some inner speech because you've been told to do it. And you've got our approach of you're doing some inner speech because you actually wanted to do it. You did some inner speech because you did some inner speech. The difference between elicited and spontaneous inner speech. And we looked at what was going on in the brain with a focus on a couple of particular areas that we thought would be important. Left inferior frontal gyrus, Broca's area. We know it's involved in producing speech. And then an area of the brain that we picked that we thought would be a bit more to do with speech perception or, or, or audition. Shouldn't be to do with speech production. So this is what we got when we did the um, elicited inner speech. In other words, when people were doing inner speech because we told them to do it. You got activation in broker, just as you'd expect. And you got deactivation in Heschel's, which is pretty much what you'd expect. But what happens when people do inner speech spontaneously? Don't worry about the red bits for now. Just ignore the red. Um, this, look at the blue. This is when people are producing in a speech spontaneously. Nothing in Broca. Quite a lot going on in Heschel's gyrus. So if you like, the experience of producing spontaneous in a speech seems to be more like an, a hearing experience than a production experience. But essentially, these are two kinds of they, they think these are two experiences that ha seem to have totally different neural signatures, and that's really important in terms of its implications for how we study all this stuff. Uh, I'm going to have to skip through the functional systems, but essentially I think there's a way of thinking about how, how inner speech plugs into a whole bunch of different um, systems. It plugs into social cognition for producing dialogic inner speech. It plugs into theory of mind for doing representational theory of mind. And it also plugs into the default mode network in very interesting ways. I'm just going to end with some takeaway points. Inner speech plays a role in uh, a, ver a, ver a variety of functional systems in childhood and adulthood. It's hard to study, but we're getting better at it. A developmental perspective makes sense of inner speech in all sorts of ways. I've talked about a specific interest in inner dialogue as a process. I hope I've shown you the value of an interdisciplinary approach. And there are a bunch of challenges remaining, but if we're going to talk about the science of consciousness, we've got to include this stuff.
I talked about some of this research in Scientific American last summer, and there's a very quick plug for my book, now in Spanish translation as well. And that's where you'll find our project, Hearing the Voice. Thanks to the Wellcome Trust, and thanks for the invitation, Tom. I think we have an interval while uh, computers have to be changed. Is that right? Or not? So maybe a question? Are, are your slides here? OK, so in the meantime, we could entertain some questions. Over here. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm over here. I'm a person who does not hear auditory voices. I hear silent thinking voices. And I'm quite aware of this for several reasons. One is sometimes I wake up and just before I'm awake, while well, I'm kind of lying there, I'm hearing music, I'm hearing a voice, very auditory. Suddenly I wake up, I'm thinking silently, no longer hearing the voice. I've done considerable interviewing, more phenomenological surveying of about 3,000 people in terms of, 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 of visual imagery, uh, auditory imagery, and so on. And just preliminarily, it looks like maybe 15, as many as 15% might be in the category of not having auditory speech. Still have, still have content, uh, but, uh, but more auditory. Uh, if we had more time, I was going to ask about the default mode. I'll just mention this. Default mode, I think you probably have speech that's more personally oriented as opposed to more lateral areas for speech. Yeah, that's a, that's a very valuable point. Uh, thank you. I mean, the idea of... Is my, mic, my mic's gone off. The idea of uh, voices that don't have... The idea of voices that don't have an uh, acoustic quality is there right back in the very earliest days of psychiatry. So Pierre Janet, for example, described several people in articles in the 1890s who had what he called soundless voices. So these are people who are having the full phenomenology of hearing a voice, but there is no sound. And he presses on, what does it sound like? You know, and the person says, no, there's no sound, but I'm hearing a voice. And that becomes incredibly interesting as well when you do some work on deaf people hearing voices, people who have been deaf from birth. They do hear voices, they describe their experience just as a voice hearer would describe it, but there is presumably no auditory component. And that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to understand as well. We're doing some work with a, a deafness researcher in uh, UCL in London. Thank you for your question. As, as a matter of protocol, we have time for one more question now but there will be a discussion section in general after the three speakers. So if you want to ask one question now. Yeah, a quick question. Uh, does any of your work uh, give any, shed any light on xenoglossy, glossolalia, or speaking in tongues? I, if it does, I don't really understand the connection. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to make that connection. Uh, speaking, in, speaking in tongues is um, I, I haven't made that connection personally. Do you, do you see a way it would connect? Uh, well, I know that there's some research that's been done on that um, at the uh, Penn State University, but uh, I couldn't go beyond that as far as which area the brains are affected. Uh, I know the researcher whose name escapes me uh, determined that, uh, that it was a real thing. It was not something that was being made up. I think that kind of relates to some of the things that you said about your own research. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that if I heard in my inner speech somebody speaking in tongues, I'd get very worried. <laughs> uh, the interesting research, the classic research on that is done by Rock LaCour uh, in, uh, at um, Université Montréal, uh, uh, in which he argued that what sounds like sort of babbling and so on, nonetheless captures a lot of the phonological regularities of the native language, which is, which is not too surprising. Okay, Rini, Rini? 
Okay, while Rini is setting up, uh, uh, let me um, make one personal anecdote about inner speech. Uh, when I read a letter or a memo or a note or something from people that I know well, I hear different voices. So if I see a letter or a memo written about something uh, from my wife, I hear her voice. Uh, same with my son. That seems every day. What's a little creepy is when I read, by chance, if I come across a letter from my mother, who died many years ago. There I am reading, and there I am hearing her voice. It's a miracle to me, it's a wonder to me how this happens, uh, that I recreate the actual different voices as a function. And it only works when it's handwritten. Uh, email, I never got email from my mother, but, uh, <laughs> And I don't want to now. <laughs> uh, but email from my wife is just email. But when it's handwritten, it really has force. I, I'm sure there's some import to that. OK, let me now introduce Rini. So the second, the second wizard that we have is Rini Huibrechts. No, that's not right. Huibrechts. There. No. Well, all these pronunciations were right in, in the course of time, I, I guess. Yeah, well, that's, Rini, that's Rini's personality coming out. Very forgiving. So Rini has a very distinguished history as, as someone put it to me, a linguist's linguist. Uh, he has worked in a number of areas, but is a, has been a staunch explorer and defender of uh, modern generative theory. Um, he's known now for a discovery that everybody or many people took for granted for many years, a, formal, uh, a discovery about the formal power of uh, natural language, the formal requirements of natural language that natural language is in fact beyond weak uh, capacity, context-free grammar, partially motivated some by some studies of Dutch, but other considerations as well. He was a professor at Utrecht for many years, and then at Gilberg, uh, and then in sort of semi-retirement, uh, but sneaking under the wire of the European requirement that you really retire at age 65, a uh, combination of appointments at Utrecht and Leiden. Uh, he's worked on generative syntax and also uh, a very unique recent study on the implications of an early split in the human uh, line, uh, suggesting, uh, evidence suggesting that uh, before the split, the basic essentials of language uh, had become possible in humans, but after the split, uh, actually the expression of language in speech uh, has uh, emerged, which is interesting since it supports the distinction between inner, inner language and outer speech. I'll read you an encomium from a well-known linguist uh, about Rini. It says, Rini is a linguist linguist, a superb scholar and scientist who is a legend in the field because of the breadth of his knowledge and understanding and the many acute insights he has contributed over the years, sometimes in print, very often in informal discussion and critical analysis. So, a real scholar. Well, my, my mouse doesn't seem to be working, but I, I can do it without, I hope. Before starting, I would like to uh, say that I feel very honored to be allowed to present the talk at this conference, a rich platform for addressing questions and raising issues about that uh, show that impairment of conscious access may be interpreted as an effective, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, I, lost, I lost contact with my computer, yeah. Yes. Uh, 
So, so, I, I, so I just said that this is a rich platform for addressing questions and raising issues about the aspects of consciousness from totally different fields and disciplines. And um, I therefore would like to thank the organization, in particular Weber, for inviting me to this symposium. Well, the topic of this talk is, uh, is in, a, in a sense, very simple. I'm trying to get forward. Put the, put the pointer on the no, no, but the, th the thing is actually I, I don't get any, I don't see any, uh, I don't see any pointer here. I don't see any pointer here. It's, it's lost. It's lost, you see? No, 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 I see it, yes. Okay. Yes, Th that's, but then, Okay. Yeah, fine, fine, thank you. This is fine, 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 fine. Well, as I said, the topic is, is, is very, very simple. Um, in, in a word, I'm going to say that uh, hearing voices, hearing, you know, auditory, verbal auditory uh, hallucinations, is an effect of leaking. Uh, one system to another, a leaking a non-dominant uh, right cerebral language into a dominant left cerebral language. So uh, we have two language systems in our head. That, that will be, that, that will be um, the, the main idea. And um, what's interesting is that congenitally deaf persons with schizophrenia also experience these auditory verbal hallucinations. So it, it has to do with, with language, uh, deep aspects of language, not some peripheral aspects. The acoustics does not come into the picture. It's, 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 it's language internal to the head. And that's going to be very important in what's coming. Um, because one of the consequences, I hope, will be that accessibility to consciousness is channeled through left hemispheric language system exclusively. So uh, there will be miscommunication between two language systems in persons with uh, uh, schizophrenia. Um, but um, these people become conscious of that only because there is a, a left hemispheric language system that makes that possible. Um, and in, in, in a general broad sense, that will mean that uh, we, can, we can gain very rich insights in, uh, in, in, in mental processes by uh, uh, by, by, by studying actually uh, language. I mean, the, the, the studies of mental processes, which are in themselves inaccessible to, uh, to consciousness, um, can be studied and they yield insights into the nature of conscious thought. That, that's what I'm going to argue about. So um, what kind of people are we? Uh, what kind of creatures are we? Well, it's, uh, it's the title of, a, of, of, of an interesting book. Uh, which by, by Noam in uh, 2016, and his answers are much more richer than, than the answers I'll, I'll, I'll be giving. Uh, the answers in that book are, are, more are even more interesting than the question. So what kind of creatures are we? Uh, well, Homo sapiens <coughs> have, uh, is, is, we, we are a species and we have uh, at least three uh, properties. We have directional handedness, that's a species property at the population level. Uh, we have language, and, and that's very uh, extraordinary. We have uh, uh, something that is species-specific. It's uniquely human, and it is domain-specific. It's task-specific. It's, it's, it has uniquely linguistic properties. And the property it has is, is, is it's computational. Uh, it can be used in all sorts of ways, but at, at, at the core, it is, it's, it's, it's computational. And humans have... Um, uh, well, they, they have a chance of uh, getting schizophrenic. Uh, and these uh, various degrees of schizophrenia correlate with degrees of uh, decreased language localization. I, 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 I'll, I will explain that. Um, schizophren schizophrenia is a severe mental order. Well, it's apparently stable and evenly distributed condition among uh, human populations. And uh, so 
the reasonable question is, why isn't there any selection against this maladaptive trait? This, is, uh, uh, this was asked by Jean Jeu the other day. And his suggestion was that the genes that make us mad at the same time make us human. And, and, and this idea has been clearly voiced in uh, Timothy Crowe's article, Schizophrenia is the price you pay for language. And this is actually what, um, um, reading his work, uh, reading his work much later than 2008, I, I read it only recently, that got me interested in this idea. Um, we, we're not going to talk about the, the genetics, that's debatable, but he even has a, uh, he has a, um, uh, oh, a genetic story about that. But uh, his, his main idea is that failed cerebral lateralization, is a failure of, um, of specialization, is a core property of schizophrenia. And this is a, a uniquely human condition. This is what, 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 what he says. So um, the, so and th th that's why the title of this article, schizophrenia is the price of Homo sapiens pays for, for language. So, so the interesting thing is that roughly, well, well the numbers vary uh, slightly, uh, if you, if, you, if you look at the literature, but roughly 1.3% of the human population have atmospherically indecisive brains. They are uh, ambilateral, they are ambidextrous, and uh, there, there, is, there, is, there is no strictly dominant uh, hemisphere. And, and interestingly, the schizophrenic patients, persons with schizophrenia, are diagnosed for decreased language literalization. And, and and so there is some sort of relation between handedness, literalization, and language dominance. And this has been exploited by a number of people in, in different ways. Um, and when you, when, you, when, you, when you see this, when you, the number of 1.3 uh, follows from, from, from these uh, calculations. They are, they are not terribly interesting, although the theories behind them are. There are some interesting theories by Annett and Manus single locus uh, genetic theories and multi-locus genetic theories. Um, but what you see here is that there is a correlation between handedness and uh, lateralized language, but the correlation is rather weak. Um, for, um, it's true that 70% of all right-handed persons have left brain language, but only 70% of something of all left-handed persons have right uh, brain language. So, um, Directional handedness and language literalization are weakly correlated. There, there can't be any, any um, causal relation. Um, and second, for right handers, the calculations are complete. I mean, if, 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 you, if you add 97% and 3%, uh, you, you end up with 100%, that's fine. But the summation is incomplete for left handers. If, if you add 68 and uh, 90%, you come out with uh, something like 87%. And uh, since the uh, left-handers comprise roughly 10% of the general population, we are missing 1.3% of the population. And these are the left-handed or ambidextrous persons with efficient uh, cerebral literalization for language. Um, so that's, that, 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 that's, that, that's, that's an important thing. Now, the, 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 the relation between laterality and, and language is, 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 is uh, um, this is clearly established. Actually, all this work has been done by, by, by Tom uh, two generations uh, earlier. Uh, roughly, the idea is that when we are born, we are born with a roughly symmetric brain uh, with a um, quantitatively small analytic advantage for the left hemisphere. So the left hemisphere is, is, is a small edge in favor of doing analytical tasks. And then the brain gets lateralized, and that results in a left hemisphere being dominant for computational tasks, for analytic tasks. And also interesting, when a cortical area is predisposed uh, for some function, the corresponding area in the opposite hemisphere gets inhibited from expressing the function. <coughs> and from all these things, it follows that left language dominance uh, is, is, is necessary. Uh, well, at least if uh, language is computational, of course. But, but that's the, uh, what, what, uh, what Chomsky has been arguing about uh, since the early 50s, language is computational. And uh, if language is computational, then you will find it in, in the left hemisphere. And this was demonstrated by, by, by Tom in a number of articles. 
and he actually shows that, um, um, uh, that, that, that there's evidence for that beyond language. We have musicians, professional musicians, and people who, uh, who can listen to music like me, but who can't perform any music and don't understand it. And uh, people like me process music in, in the right hemisphere, whereas professional musicians process it in the left hemisphere. And that's precisely because the left hemisphere is uh, specialized for analytical tasks. And language, of course, uh, being computational is analytical, and um, is in, uh, naturally in the uh, left hemisphere. Uh, well, um, human beings are uh, preferentially right-handed, so it's a very weak, a very weak uh, correlation between language and, 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 and handedness. But uh, we, 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 can, we, we can suggest a, a route, uh, a very simple route. I mean, left cerebral computation leads to uh, left hemispheric language dominance, right? Uh, now, <clears throat> suppose that if you're doing skilled manual action, complex manual action, then uh, it's reasonable to, 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 to assume that that, um, that that requires a com complexly structured thought. So you, you need some complex thinking to do some uh, complex manual task. Now, complex structured thought implies hierarchical structure. The, hier the hierarchical structure is provided by the computational language. And um, then there is a minimization uh, of, of, uh, condition. Suppose you would, you would execute things as simply as you can then uh, you uh, would hope for a minimization of conduction delay between the, the, the thought system and, and, and the motor system executing uh, whatever it is you're thinking about in, in, in for, for, for the task of executing these um, skilled manual labor. So um, to, to minimize conduction delay of, uh, uh, b b between the uh, hemispheres, um, you, uh, you would like to have the language being in the same hemisphere as the, the motor control for the skilled uh, manual action. So uh, the, uh, the, 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 the shortest control, and this is then left cerebral control, of skilled manual action yields preferential contralateral right-handedness. It is it's not forced, it's not necessary. You, you can use this, uh, your left hand, but there is preference for it. I mean, the, the sort of argument is the same sort of argument as the argument that was uh, used for the right ear advantage. Um, so, we said that language is in the left hemisphere if it is computational. So, maybe we should ask really a few questions about language, Darwin's questions. They were discussed in recent books, by, by, in a recent book and articles by, by Noam and Noam and Beric. And um, Darwin's questions could have been, oh, where is language, what is it? And, and, and why did it emerge? And why are so many of them? And these questions have been raised by, by Noam and by, uh, by Bob, and they have given some interesting answers. Um, but this is basically what they say. Language is, 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 a, is, a, is a system for generating thoughts. It's a computational system. And uh, it's, uh, we, we are born with that. With, uh, we, we have a, a genetic predisposition for, for yielding an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions. That's the computational system. And these expressions must receive interpretations at, at, at the two interfaces, at the semantic interface, uh, the con con conceptual, intentional interface, and the uh, sensory motor interface for, for, for the sound. So, uh, well, Chomsky has been arguing that language is a system of sound, of a meaning with sound. So, um, and there is a preference for meaning. We'll come to that. So, in terms of evolution, uh, what, has, uh, what, what evolution has done is uh, it has assembled abilities that were already placed a long time ago, the semantics and the phonology, um, and the sensory motor systems and the cognitive systems, and they, 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 they were assembled in a novel phenotype. And uh, this is the computational system linked to these two uh, inter in interface systems. And uh, th that's an uh, in important uh, idea because um, um, it, there are reasons, to sh there are several reasons that, that um, for, for assuming, not for assuming, but for proposing the idea that, that uh, the semantics has priority, the mapping to the semantics has priority over the mapping to phonology. Um, 
um, the map XO is asymmetric. So it's, it's really sort of optimal with respect to the um, uh, mapping to the semantic and pragmatic interface, the thought system, but it is sort of um, uh, problematic with a lot of variance uh, with respect to the uh, sensory motor system for externalization. There are lots of parametric, uh, there's, lots, there's lots of parametric variation, and uh, uh, I mean, all the different languages uh, testify to that. So um, the, the basic idea for, for us now is that language is primarily an instrument of thought, audible thinking, term Noam uses a lot, with uh, the sensory motor, um, the sensory modalities, so the speech or sign, uh, secondarily. Um, but then the answers to, Noam's, to Darwin's questions are pretty, pretty easy. Um, I mean, what's language? It's a computational system, it's a biological system, which is, well, uniquely human, and it is task specific, it's domain specific, it's computational. And with specific properties you won't find elsewhere. So uh, this property, recursivity, uh, a way to reapply, well, a rule reapplying to Z output, um, giving a potential infinity, that, that recursive language emerged as an accepted byproduct of uh, something else, maybe a rewired brain that had tripled in size since, uh, since, uh, since uh, chimpanzee time, before the split um, um, with, with chimps. And um, the, that, that's, that's an answer to the question, why did it arise? And the question, why are, there, why, are so, why, why there are so many languages? Well, the answer to that is simple. It's, uh, well, there are some different solutions to the problem of externalization. Because uh, you, you, you have a, a simple cognitive system and, uh, and, and a system used for thought, another system uh, for expressing the thought. But there are several solutions for, 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 for uh, that, that for executing that, 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 that solution, there are, there, there, are, there are many there are many solutions for. Um, for um, to, to, so I'm sorry. This one. So you, you have you have let's say a simple system of thought, and to express that, uh, well, you have to connect that to uh, to sensory motor systems. But that, that's, that, that's 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 a huge bag of different uh, possibilities. You, you can speak and sign and, and other things. So it's not easy to come up with a, a single solution. That's why there are so many um, uh, languages. Uh, the, the way to come up with a solution uh, are, 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 are manifold. Now, uh, so in short, this is a simple picture. So this is language. We have this UG, the faculty of language, uh, with a uh, uh, basic principle giving you uh, the, the, the possibility of yielding uh, an unbounded range of uh, structures, and these structures have to receive a meaning and a sound. The meaning, the mapping to the meaning, the universal principles are, are really almost invariant. They are perfect, primary, and, and the mapping to the sound is just uh, bricolage, is tinkering. But the inner speech, it's now it's conscious thought, it's the mapping to the meaning is the internal use of externalized language. So we, we generate these expressions. They get an, an language, a mind internal semantic and phonological interpretation. Um, um, this, is, this is externalized language, but this is used internally. So we, we, have a, we generate roughly a uh, well, a full language in our head, but um, it's, it's, it's used internally. Um, so this is uh, for, for normal peoples. And to give you an idea what, uh, what, what, what language really is, because uh, there are a lot of confusions about what language is, and we have to make clear what we, what, what we mean, but why we say meaning and sound, and uh, asymmetry of the mappings. Um, what, what, is, what, is, what is very important is that, that Human language has a property that is absent in, in the rest of the animal kingdom, so it's a, a biological isolated property, unique, novel. novel. And, um, and to illustrate the working of this unique property, this unique combinatorial operation merge, 
uh, you, you, you see that, um, well, you can see that on the screen. If you take two little elements, atomic elements, let's say likes and himself, and you combine that, right? That's simple. And, and, and you get the, 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 the branch, the, the branching figure, the tree diagram, uh, uh, the left bottom. Um, and you can do this recursively, so you add John to Lux himself, and you get John Lux himself. And the interesting thing is this. Uh, I use this sentence to show that it's, it's not arbitrary. I, I mean, suppose we, we twist the uh, John and himself, we would have a sentence himself like John, which is ungrammatical in English, right? Now, the thing is that this sentence is fine because himself is, is, a, is a word crying for an antecedent, and the antecedent is higher in the tree, you see? So, so John, every, every, every constituent containing John contains himself, but not the other way around. So in, in, a, in a particular precise sense, John is hierarchically higher than himself. And, and, and this hierarchy you get for free. I mean, uh, that's the result of merge. That's, uh, uh, the result of, of this operation. There's no other way to represent that. So, uh, and that's an important property. Um, we can go further on. We can say himself, John Lux, and, and that's another uh, illustration of Mertz. Now you take the himself, which is part of John Lux himself, and the whole phrase, John Lux himself, and you connect them. And that gives you himself, John Lux. And if the operation is simple, you leave behind, if the operation is simple, if you if, if, you, if, you, if you assume the simplest possible operation, um, and then you get the uh, conserv conservation of structure, and that means if you, uh, if you apply that operation, you have him solve at the top, and you retain a, a copy downstairs. So, so in this structure, although him solve is, uh, is heard in a particular position, I mean the first sentence of the word, it's also present downstairs. Right? That, that, that's, that's very important. And you can still say here that John is the element that, that is structurally higher than himself. It's higher than the blue himself, right? It's higher than the copy. And this remains an, an invariant property of this structure. John was, is also here higher in the hierarchy than a copy of himself. And, and, and that is fine. Now, all this is very simple. I mean, it's the simplest example I can think of. It's just a, a three-word sentence, right? Um, um, but that's enough to, to, to make, it's, it's enough to make, well, I, I'll skip this. I mean, it's, it's, it, this, this is going to show that this property of hierarchically uh, uh, higher, than something else, uh, it gives you um, um, a means of reducing the space. I mean, if you really, uh, if this is a real result, you know, the hierarchy, then the search space for looking for antecedents for, let's say, uh, uh, words like himself, uh, get reduced logarithmically. But I'll, I'll forget that here. I, I'll, uh, um. So, turning back to a case like John likes himself. That's, that's English, and that's fine. And as I said, if you, 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 you permute himself and John, that's, that's no good, that's, that's no English. But in fact, there are languages where this is the only option available. Austronesian languages, Malagasy is one, 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 one example of that. So now you, you see what, what's very obvious. If you are asked to give an explanation for these facts, and if you look at just at the linear order, so at the the the, the stream of speech, the stream of words, in speech, then you are not going to find a unification, right? Because uh, everything you find for English is contradicted in Malagasy in the other way around. So forget about linear order. It's 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 uh, it's impossible to do that. That's let's say it's proof. You can't do that. But there is unification in terms of structure. You see, because in in, in all these sentences, the John, blue, is in a higher position than himself. Every constituent containing John contains himself, but not the other way around. And that holds for English and for Malagasy. 
So this is, uh, and, and, and languages work that way. And it's, it's, it's no exceptions. It can't be because it's part of your, of your gene. I mean, there are no exceptions. Um, um, some people argue that they have found ex exceptions, like in, in Balkan languages, Greek and, and, uh, and uh, Albanian. But uh, we can't go into that. But I mean, um, I, I did that in my own time. Uh, and uh, when you analyze these sentences, they, they come out the same as this. I mean, it's slightly, slightly more different, but uh, they actually provide further evidence. Um, um, the same way the, uh, the, 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 the more complex sentence, himself John likes. That's fine in, in English, and uh, it's wrong in, in Austronesian. In Austronesian, in Malagasy, you must say 4A. So himself is again here to the right of John. So the, the, the facts are totally um, reversed. So you can't do that with a new order. So the, the, the conclusion is that, uh, that uh, hierarchy, hierarchical subject expressions are, are very fundamental and primary in language. And uh, this uh, principle is universal. And it conforms to, uh, to, 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 to more general principles of structure dependence. And actually, it also supports this combination, this combinatorial combination we're talking about, merge, uh, the copy theory. Now, we, forget, we have no time for that. But I mean, uh, I talked about top, top down, hierarchy, and left right. There's also another dimension, labeling. And that gives you also very interesting uh, explanations for things you would not have expected it to be. These, uh, but I, I, I'll skip that. So, so far. We have talked about lateralization and directional handedness and relations between them. We have talked about left brain computational language, merge, the asymmetry in the mapping to the interfaces, the conceptual and intentional interface, meaning, and the sensory motor interface, externalization. So now let's, let's enter into the real topic. What's, what's uh, uh, auditory verbal hallucinations? So once again, before we say uh, goodbye to, 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 to language, this is the language structure. We have a generative procedure characterizing an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions. And each of these expressions receive the interpretations and meaning interpretations for further mental processes and a sound interpretation for externalization at the two different interfaces. What I'm going to say is that for people with schizophrenia, there are, there's not one such system, there are two such systems in their head. One in the left hemisphere, one in the right hemisphere. Um, so we get this, uh, this diagrammatic uh, representation. And what I'm saying is that auditory verbal hallucinations are interaction effects of two internal language systems. The uh, dominant, sorry, the non-dominant right-brained language, I call that other, is feeding into the uh, dominant left brain language, I call that self. And what you have is that um, there are unconscious processes generated by um, this uh, language internal system in the right brain, in, in, yes, in the right hemisphere, and that produces an intention and, and, and a motor representation. But the repre representation uh, might be further processed in the right brain, but importantly, it gets transferred, it gets leaked into the sensory system of, of the left brain. So the right brain is generating internal language, but some of the internal language is leaked into, is released into, is transferred into the other language system, which is dominant, the sensory motor system. And then it gets interpreted within that system, and that gives you uh, the meaning of what you hear. And, uh, you hear a strange voice, an alien voice, and, uh, but you don't hear a voice because uh, the, the, uh, deaf people with schizophrenia also hear these voices. So it's, it's not an acoustic thing. So th there, is, there, is a, there, is a, there is a sound representation, but it's not, it's, it's not externalized. It's part of the language, but it's part of, of the language you, you have no control over. It's, it's in, the, in the right part. And when it enters into the left part, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's strange, right, for you. It's, uh, it's like you hear a, a strange voice. Um, um, you, you, are, you, you, well, you, you have conscious awareness only of what, what's, what's processed in, in the left brain, that this is actually what, what it means. 
So, um, so conscious awareness is is uh, is, is caused. It comes about by by uh, left brain action, actually by language. So that, that might be interesting. Um, well, there's another talk by by uh, Andrea, and he will talk about this, no doubt. But interestingly, uh, what what he said is that. There is electrocortical activity in higher level language areas which match the acoustics. And so there is, uh, what he says is actually the same thing as I uh, was trying to say just before, that uh, language is deeply represented, also the sound aspects are deeply represented in, in, in Broca's area before it gets uh, expressed. And interestingly for me, the same cortical activity uh, they found, they also found with silent reading, so uh, w without any externalization. And they found that with congenitally deaf people and even with prelingually deaf schizophrenic people. So uh, that's very interesting because that means that the, uh, the, the sound system is there, but it's there also at a deeper level. And it's only later that it'll get externalized. So, um, and, 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 and there's a time factor involved then, of course, because the neural activity in, in the Broca's brain is modality neutral, it can be signed, it can be spoken, and that precedes the neutral activity of the sensory system where it is pronounced. Now, um, the sketch of the argument. We all discussed A, B, C, D. For uh, lack of time, I, I'll, I'll, I don't skip that because I, I, I talked with it, but it was formally uh, put on the screen. The, the most important thing is F, G, H. So um, <clears throat> we, 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 we have said that people with schizophrenia, persons with schizophrenia are diagnosed for failed cerebral lateralization. Now, this is, this is the central part, G. Schizophrenic subjects with uh, auditory verbal hallucinations show both right hemispheric and left hemispheric neural activity in homologous language centers. And that was shown in fMRI studies by, um, by uh, actually by a Utrecht professor, uh, Iris Sommer, but that has been shown in before that and after that several times, and that's the interesting thing. Now, there are, there are two mainstreams in, in, in research in uh, auditory verbal hallucination. Um, um, uh, some say that hallucinations result from a failure to recognize self-generated speech. That's fine, but then, of course, you do not um, uh, um, um, account for the uh, right hemispheric activity. Or you say uh, auditory verbal hallucinations result from a release of uh, language activity from right to left. That's what I'm saying. It's also fine, but in itself, that doesn't explain why uh, uh, left hemispheric activity is present as well. Now, what I'm saying is that the auditory verbal hallucinations are structured expressions internally generated by the non-dominant right hemispheric language system, but are processed at the, other in, at, at the, at the semantic and, and sound interfaces of the dominant left hemisphere. So hearing voices is just the left cerebral dominant language consciously hearing expressions that are unconsciously generated uh, by the right cerebral non-dominant language. Well, uh, I'll give some illustrations uh, about these hallucinations and, and, and some other. So, th so this is actually a diagra diagrammatic representation of auditory verbal hallucination, right? Uh, the, the, the red is the other voice, the right, the right half of the brain, right, uh, uh, the right hemisphere, and a meaning gets a motor interpretation and that gets transferred to, uh, to the sensory system. We, 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 we talked about that. Um, in fact, there are 25 possible inter in, 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 in interconnections. Um, we only show three. Uh, you, you, can, you can easily find out for yourself, but I mean, um, there are 25 possibilities, and, 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 the, and the trick is to find out if each of these interactions correspond to a particular uh, positive uh, symptom of schizophrenia. Um, um, well, I pointed out, th well, I illustrated three, but I'll, I'll concentrate on, on, on uh, auditory verbal hallucinations, thought insertion, and thought withdrawal. Now, this is thought, thought insertion. So sometimes you, people with schizophrenia think uh, 
uh, uh, foreign will, thought is imposed upon them. Well, this is the, this is the picture. I mean, it, it, uh, thought is generated to the right and is leaked into the motor system uh, of the left, and, and then it is transferred further. The opposite is thought withdrawal. The thought can be stolen from you. That's when you make up a thought, but then it again it gets leaked into the other system. But that's you have no control on the other system. That's totally uh, unconscious. Um, no. No. So um, there are some. Yeah. Um, the, the, the the interesting thing now is that. Uh, there is some sort of a paradox. So we, we, we can reach interesting ideas about uh, conscious awareness, but um, these ideas are developed by looking not at, uh, you know, at, uh, at, at, at uh, this notion, because she's aware, it's very, it's very hard to define what that is. I mean, we, we, uh, we, we can talk about it, and everyone understands what we are saying, but it's really hard to find out actually what that is. But we can get some insight by studying things that are unconscious and that are inaccessible in principle to consciousness by, 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 by looking at the mechanisms responsible for, for, um, for um, what we think is. is, is conscious awareness. Um, and, and this was actually then, by, by Noam, at least, uh, years back in, in, in 1980. And the um, um, thing is then that what reaches consciousness in inner speech, whatever that is, uh, it's, it's Noam talked about that the other day, is, is fragments of mental processes. The mental processes we can, we, we can study, and, um, and, 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 and these give us some, uh, some results. I mean, these amalgams. Sometimes uh, we, we, we are aware of products of these mental processes uh, linked up with, uh, with, with uh, operations of the sensory motor system because we, we hear externalized language internally. We, as Jomsky said, we, 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 can, we hear, uh, without speaking, uh, rhymes. We can decide whether or not thin and sin rhymes. And uh, from my perspective, uh, a, a person with schizophrenia will hear strange voices, but he will only hear the voices in, in, in languages he, he's familiar with. So uh, um, a, a person not knowing Russian will not uh, hear uh, strange Russian voices. So, and. From our perspective, from this, from the, from, from the perspective of this conference, consciousness, I think, language fragments. What is important is that these language fragments that reach consciousness, these these amalgams of these different systems, they, they reach consciousness only from the left cerebral language. So, whatever causes consciousness, conscious awareness is is, is caused, or is, um, is is made possible through the <coughs> left cerebral language. Uh, so, um, let's conclude. Well, these conclusions are uh, speaking for themselves. So, uh, the, the, main, the main two conclusions that these uh, auditory verbal hallucinations are interfection effects from the non-dominant internal language. And uh, they uh, provide evidence, in my mind, that uh, these uh, internal language fragments reach consciousness only from the uh, language dominant hemisphere. So, language is is crucially involved in higher order consciousness. Thank you. Let's see. What's the overtime? We, if there are questions, we have time for perhaps one or two uh, before. But I remind you, there will be a general discussion after the third talk. Go ahead. Uh, current, current research shows that there is a correlation between a schizophrenic um, patient diagnosed with schizophrenia and toxoplasmosis. I'm sorry. I... Can, can you hear me? 
there's a um, current research shows that there's a correlation between a patient being diagnosed with schizophrenia and toxoplasmosis and considering that toxoplasmosis can affect sight, hearing, I mean, it also involves seizures, possibility of seizures, how might that um, play into everything that we're speaking about, we're talking about today, um, as far as intake when doing research um, and considering all of that, um, the alteration in the sensory experience? Well, I, I don't know if I understand. Reading. I don't know if I understood the question, you know, reasonably well. But um, I'm sure I. I don't think I can give an answer uh, to that. It's uh, to consider. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, no, no. I, uh, I as I told you. Um, it's, 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 it's the first for me. It's the first introduction into the field. I was, uh, I, I, I was seeing what uh, what 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 uh, psychologists were saying, what language is saying, what 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 letterization people are saying, and uh, I, I thought they, they they talk, you know, uh, but they do not communicate with one another. And uh, then uh, knowing what they know about language, uh, and, and 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 seeing what what how, how many different. Uh, uh, let's say uh, positive symptoms for uh, schizophrenia there are, I wanted to find out if there was a precise way of, uh, of, of combining these two. So it's, it's, it's just a formal proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it is totally, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm very modest here, you know. I, uh, I, I mean, th there are similarities and, and total dissimilarities with uh, Charles' talk. Um, so the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the disturbances between uh, the two, I mean, the leakage from one hemisphere to another uh, is accounted for different by, uh, by, by Charles. But on the other hand, uh, I try to give an, an explanation for the different types of, um, of interactions, which uh, you didn't talk about, and maybe you can, I don't know. Uh, so uh, this, this is actually uh, <laughs> my answer. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I was only interested in finding out a solution for a very specific problem. And I thought I could find that uh, by uh, taking together different strands from different fields and connect them. And the way to connect them is, uh, is what I showed. And it was inspired by Crow, but the, 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 the real stuff is by, uh, by Sommer, showing that there is always, with persons with uh, auditory verbal hallucination, there is activity both right and in the, in the right brain and, and, and the left brain. And uh, this is actually, there's no more I can say, I'm sorry. No, no, thank you, and it was fabulous, thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. Very quick question. <clears throat> okay. That's a very quick answer. Do you know if there are different kinds of inner speech uh, mechanisms? Like if I'm producing my own thought or if I'm repeating your voice in my head, for example, or this kind of uh, different inner speech systems? Sorry? Do you know if there are different kind of inner speech mechanisms? Um, if I'm Im just emitting your own voice in my head, for example, or if I'm producing my own thought, like preparing my list of groceries, for example, or do something you know what like he's that. Here? I don't have a very quick answer. Do, do, do you know what he's doing? No, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we, we have a problem. Both of us have a problem understanding you. Maybe you can you can talk, uh, you know, with, with, without the microphone. I, I would suggest making this a, a personal yes. conversation where it'll be yes, easier we can to understand. Up, yeah, okay, Andrea. So the final wizard of the day. Uh, <laughs> do you use your own computer? Okay, so we have to get the audiovisual person. Okay. Uh, okay, before I introduce Andrea, let me note in re regard to Rini's talk, um, in a relatively small study, about 40 people, with high-functioning schizophrenics, where we examined 
the laterality in each individual as with various behavioral measures, uh, but also um, looked at uh, using a genom genomic model, looked at the risk in the right-handed uh, uh, patients, um, and left-handed actually, uh, for left-handedness. The, the familiar, crudely put, the question was whether the patient had familiar left-handedness or not. And what we find is that independent of phenotypic laterality in an individual, uh, a stronger prediction is associated with the risk that that person had based on family evidence of having been a phenotypic uh, left-hander. So there's sort of an inner left-handedness uh, uh, that is at issue that may be genetically controlled, that may be related to the kind of phenomena that Rini was talking about. Okay, you want? Ah, good. So to Andrea. Um, Andrea, I would say, uh, in a certain way, is a uh, intellectual scientific bricoleur. He puts together different fields, highly technical, uh, in each case, and creates new kinds of knowledge, some of which you'll hear about today. He's founder and former director of the Center Neuroscience, Epistemology, and Theoretical Syntax, the breadth of which already gives you some idea of what I'm talking about. He's vice rector of the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in Pavia, and in that capacity, he pulls together uh, many uh, universities, many uh, programs in cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience. Um, his main field of research in one, look one way, is theoretical syntax on the one hand and neurobi neurobiological foundations of language on the other. Uh, and we'll hear about some of his uh, uh, contributions today. He's got lots of books, quite prolific, at least 10 by my account. Uh, many journal articles in profound and major journals. And as a whole man uh, and scholar put together, he is a member of the scientific board of the Science and Faith Foundation, uh, which is at the Holy See, which brings uh, modern science uh, together with scientists uh, within the Vatican. Uh, as I say, as a whole man and scholar. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the previous talk was so interesting that I would like to give up mine, but uh, since I made my homework, let me go through it. Um, um, I have a limited goal here. It is to illustrate an, an experiment exploring inner speech from a brain perspective and show what the results obtained in the experiment posed for a theory of language. I would like to start um, with a citation from Wittgenstein that sort of sets uh, some of the questions that are raised by inner speech, and I call it Wittgenstein's problem. Is it conceivable that people should never speak an audible language, but should nevertheless talk to themselves inwardly in imagination? Um, even just from this uh, citation, you already get the issue of what is externalized and what is thought. Actually, this immediately poses the question of the chronological um, path where these two capacity appears. And strangely enough, I have found in Lucretius the trace of the first reflection of, on this issue. There are two beautiful lines from the De Rerum Natura uh, that can tr be translated easily like that, but rather the origin of the tongue came long before speech. And this is the citation that sort of make us understand how the reflection on this each particular issue of thought and language, uh, uh, you know, our constant thought of linguistic, uh, linguistic theory inside. But let me uh, go through a preliminary issue. I would like to highlight that there is a sharp different um, issue when it comes to externalization versus sound representation. Externalization can be regarded as a modality-independent, ancillary, non-optimal motor process, 
making the structure built by a binary compositional operation, the unbounded merge that uh, Ryan Rainey was talking about before, available to senses and communication. Uh, of course, externalization is modality independent for several reasons. First of all, I mean, th the major striking fact is that we can externalize with gestures. Being an Italian, I seem to be provided with the right genes to do that. But I will keep my hands on my back so that you don't get distracted by the foreign languages I may speak while talking. And on the other hand, you do have verbal, verbal thought. But externalization is a very complex uh, phenomenon. And actually, uh, it requires a mode of planning which may be exploited also for deciphering the incoming message. The famous paper by Lieberman that you know, prove that people, when they understand what you say, use the motor planning to facilitate interpretation of sound is one case. But we have to exclude um, that motor planning and grammar are interlinked in an in a, in a, in a inherently interesting way. Uh, in fact, the complexity of motor planning has nothing to do with the complexity of grammar, despite the fact that, you know, persons like Corbalis or Pulver suggested that mirror neurons and language are just the evolution of, of um, sorry, the language is just the evolution of a sophisticated procedure of gesture that is implemented and, you know, reacts in our brain with a mirror neuron system. Actually, first of all, there is no visibility of syntax in gesture. If syntax is the complex hierarchical structure that um, Rini was illustrating before, when you have sequences of gesture, you lose th that kind of architecture. And actually, it's not even true that the sequences of actions included in externalization may be explained by a grammar that is similar to what uh, we have in syntax. But now, if we can set apart the issue of externalization as a motor planning still, the problem remains of what happens to sound. Well, we can distinguish two separate problems, representation of sound during perception and, and this is the major thing that I would like to suggest here, is what happens to sound representation during language production. That will be the focus of the talk, the minimal focus of my talk. First of all, uh, we know that sound representation is a way where the nervous system transduces different physical stimuli, including sound patterns, into a common internal medium, which is an electric oscillation of, you know, due to the neuronal activity. It goes way back to Lord Adrian uh, um, works in the foundational works in the field. Uh, the first surprising fact we know, though, besides the fact that sound has to be translated into electric waves, is the following. First, we know that sound is mapped onto the auditory cortex in the superior temporal gyrus. This is known. But what is uh, surprisingly, what was surprisingly discovered recently is that the electric waves preserving sound shapes are also present outside the auditory cortex in Broca's area. So it's not only that the sound that you are hearing now is tonotopically represented in the tissue of your brain corresponding to auditory cortex, but it also goes up to an area that is connected where there is a network that has nothing to do with sound. So for example, a network which is sensitive to recursion structures as opposed to linear structure or uh, morphology uh, errors of that kind. Now, this suggests that we may uh, pose a question uh, when it comes to representation of sound in the brain that goes beyond perception. The question is, when is sound pattern represented in the brain during language production? Well, obviously, I am talking now, I am producing sound, the sound also goes back to my ear and I hear myself, but does it only enter from outside um, um, as, it's not here, as you know, uh, an event of hearing the words we utter? Actually, uh, in that case, the perception of the speech code is unuseful because there is no way we, we can, uh, uh, you, you can, 
see each other uh, producing that sound. But that's where the experiment that I want to illustrate comes in. There is a surprising fact, which is not so surprising after two talks on inner speech, but suppose that I'm giving this talk to people who didn't hear the first two. That would still be surprising. I hope you'll be surprised by the fact that I have a saying. That has nothing to do with my link with the Vatican, which, is, which actually had only two concrete outputs of inviting Noam Chomsky and Bob Berry giving a talk in the Vatican. And uh, a book with, uh, with Noam talk is coming out in September. And it was actually, uh, I am still surprised for the fact that people are still talking about your, your, your talk in there. But anyway, here's the scent. And I want to reproduce something that another scent said about this guy doing something that in medieval time was prohibited. Let's hear, well, hear. Let's read what he said. When Ambrose, which is the saint here, read, his eyes scanned the page and his heart sought out the meaning, but his voice was silent and his tongue was still. This is Augustine in a confession talking about an saint. He was doing something prohibited in medieval time, keeping the meaning inside with producing no sound. This is something obviously that we do every day. And so th this is where the experiment comes in. If I um, had to set the technology that I'm going to illustrate now in a broader framework, I would say that neurolinguistic is now getting from the, the where problem to the what problem. The where problem is to identify which network is selected when you perform a linguistic task. This is not trivial though. For example, it could be used to prove an intuition that um, um, Noam Chomsky uh, had back in the 50s, and it's one of the foundational thought of genetic grammar, namely that only a selected type of grammar, namely those that have uh, um, a recursive structure and a certain kind of dependencies are implemented in human language. People could say that there was a cultural artifact. In fact, if you go back to the introduction to the biological foundation of language by Lenneberg, he was aware of that and he declared that his book was tried to demolish the idea that syntax is a, is a conventional cultural artifact. Now, the where problem can play a role in that because one of the things you can do, and in fact, I tried to do that with uh, three different uh, teams, was to design grammar that were not um, hierarchically constructed according to the rules of UG, and we proved that the, the part of the brain that was computing those grammar was a different one with respect to the one which is normally used to, um, to perform linguistic tasks. So the where problem becomes interesting only insofar as you have competing theories and you can have empirical arguments to choose in be between them. But the where problem is in a sense a kind of a superficial problem because ultimately we're interested to understand what neurons say to each other when we compute a linguistic structure. And neuroimaging, unfortunately, is not the, you know, the, the, the proper method to, do, to understand the what problem. For the what problem, we have to shift to a different kind of information, not the metabolic information where you have certain network activated as opposed to other, but rather uh, a kind of information you can get from the electric activity of single of group of neurons. Uh, this field is very rapidly expanding. The technique that I use with a group in, in Pavia uh, with Lorenzo Magrassi and uh, Valerio Anovazzi, a neurosurgeon and electric engineer, was, is due to a fact that sometimes a um, neurosurgeon when they want to preserve the functionality of the part of the brain that they have to cut, they may want to understand if the part of the brain that they, were, that they are cutting, for example, to pick up a tumor, um, uh, should not be cut. So what they do, in fact, the person who decided, uh, who, who did that, sorry, uh, this is the wrong order. Anyway, you take the patient, um, you make him sleep, you open the skull, and then what you do, you wake him up or her up, and then you, with an electric pointer, you interfere with the activity of the cortex, asking to perform some of the tasks that are related to the exposed part of the brain. 
If the task gets interrupted, then you know that you cannot cut that position because otherwise, when the patient wakes up, that function would be, would be ruined. Now, you can do that, but of course, in the same time, what you can do, you can measure the electrical cortical activity during this cognitive task. This was uh, um, represented in a, in a wonderful book that I think it's not really available, but George Ogerman, um, Conversation with Niels Bray. That is, it, I mean, it's not only a tribute to a founder of the field, but Ogerman provided a way to individuate the Broca's area in a functional way. That is, there is a point in the left hemisphere, most of um, right-handed people of, in the dominant hemisphere, which if you touch it, that if you touch it, you have a speech arrest. That's, that is one of the way to have, um, to, to individuate Broca's area. In an interesting paper by Ogerman, the individual difference in the surface of the brain is, goes up to eight centimeters per individual, so it has to be fixed uh, that way. Otherwise, you don't, um, you, don't have, you don't measure the right position. Now, let me give you straightforwardly the paradigm we use for the, for the experiment. First of all, uh, the number of people that got involved in the experiment is overwhelmingly great with respect to the normal kind of experiment. Normally, you have one, two, or three patients. We had to go through 16 because we thought we were just mismeasuring what went on. The subjects were asked to read the same words presented at the same pace on a screen, first aloud and then silently. This is um, the paper as it came out in, in yeah, the yes. Now, um, reading is something that is exceptionally complicated. There is a paper by Tom uh, all language understanding is a psycholinguistic guessing game, swaying still small voice, which I think is illuminating on the notion of reading. And it makes it clear that reading is an extremely complex, uh, multi-level uh, procedure. Um, I don't understand if we had any result that can uh, illuminate this process, but at least I, am, I, can, I can rely on the fact that for what matters here, while you read, you do not produce physical suck. Sound. So let me give you uh, step by step uh, the, how the experiment works. This is the, the, ex the real way, uh, the real representation of, of the brain that we tested. So you have one, two, three, four, five different um, uh, signal representations. The first is sound, where a fragment of sound is isolated. Then you first had the audio signal times expansion, and what you get there. It's technically called an envelope. There is a cure which is tangent to each member of the family at some point. That is, let's say, like, you know, saying this, the, the upper part of the oscillation. Then you have the electrode. So you filter the envelope of the electrode and you filter the acoustic sound. You have the last two. So in the last two, you have the um, oscillation corresponding to sound and the other corresponding to the filter electrode. Of course, ideally, what you would do is to compare them. You compare the sound pattern, the sound waves, with the electric wave. But unfortunately, you can do that only when you externalize sound. When you do not, you do not know when to start the measurement. So the mathematics goes fairly complicated, and you have to go through what is called um, and you have to compare uh, the curve in a way that is the, a correlation between the two. Technically, uh, what you do is you do something like that. You make the cross correlation, you take, take the, the middle side, you have two different kind of, of curve, and then you slide one over the other, the common area generates another function. And the way that the function goes represents the amount of correlation of the first two functions. The result we're striking, and this is why I am talking about them today, um, the ECOG, that is the electrocorticogram, which is the electronic, the electric uh, waves, and the sound correlation in Broca's area during 50 seconds of inner speech and allowed reading is a strong similarity, practically. From a statistical point of view, there, is no, there was no real difference from 
reading words aloud and keeping them in your mind when it comes to the correlation between the electric waves and the sound waves. Of course, we made all kind of, of possible contrast. So these two are the ones that you already show, that you already saw, but we tried you know, to get information from the parietal lobe, which is outside Broca's area, or in Broca's area, but with interpretation of a, a figure that was someone pushing a button. So the, the immediate result we had was that during inner speech, the representation of sound is there in Broca's area, even if it do not produce any sound. There are two interesting facts I want to add to this picture. First, there is a very interesting note. This is the, you know, the, in time, the correlation between the envelope that is sound and the electrode. Interestingly enough, the highest correlation, the moment where the, elect the electric representation of sound and the real representation of sound uh, correlate more happens before you speak, even when you speak, 170 milliseconds before you produce sound, you do have uh, the highest correlation between sound and the oscillatory process. This is, again, very interesting because it's not that you you're hearing yourself. It's just before you do that. And that has nothing to do with the motor planning. Uh, the reason why I insist on the fact that it has nothing to do with motor planning is many people reacted to the first version of the paper or the, the experiment that, I, uh, the, that we um, presented as if it were a kind of a mirror neuron effect. It has nothing to do with mirror neurons. There is no action involved. It's the representation of sound that it matters here. And the second thing, which is what I find it very promising in the future is the fact that what happens in Broca's area is still relevant to grammar and syntax. In other words, we may have uh, had a wrong picture of what goes on in Broca's area. Maybe Broca's area is an acoustic area. Why not? You know, science goes like that. Maybe we mismeasure before, and I mean, people mismeasure before, and what we obtain here is the result of Broca's area is in fact an acoustic area. Contrary to what we learned before, that this Broca's area is sensitive to recursion versus non-recursion rules. So I designed a subpart of experiment where I confronted the following thing. Um, people were asked to read single long words or short sentences, same amount of syllable. Uh, intonation doesn't matter because we, we had a shuffling method that got rid of the intonational issues. So we had two kinds of stimuli, single words or sentences. From the point of view of theory of language, I don't think that there is more basic you know, uh, distinction among primitives, perhaps. I don't know if it's correct to call them primitives or not. But anyway, uh, it's clearly the case that words and sentences cannot be distinguished by physical means. They have to go through the notion of what a clause is. In fact, I would adopt Aristotle if I had to go back and say that sentence is the only thing that you can say it's true or false. But anyway, it's very complicated. Um, um, Giorgio Graffi is a historian of, linguist, uh, of linguistics, uh, um, counted the number of definition of clauses in, in the 30s, building up on uh, Ries, was ist Einsatz, which was a treatise on, on the notion of clause. And in the 30s, there were at least 300 different definitions of clauses. So clearly, there is nothing so obvious in distinguishing a clause and, and, um, or a sentence and a word. And look at the result there was a sharp distinction between single words and sentences. That is, the correlation was different. Here, um, the result from an empirical point of view stopped. That is, we have this result. Why do we have that? It's not clear. My hope, and is one where I would like to invest in the future, I don't know how much is left, but you know, we have to be optimistic, 
uh, what I would like to do, uh, even independently of my span life, I mean, um, uh, what it's interesting here is that uh, the correlation, although here you don't see it very well, but what matters is these last two, uh, the last two, raw, last two columns on the right, is lower for sentences and higher for words. So what I hope is that the channel is, when it comes to single words, is totally exploited by, or at least, uh, exploited by sound correlation, but we co the correlation with sound. When it comes to sentence, you have to have more syntactic information. So the difference between words and sentences may be the fact that uh, the, the, with sentences, the same electric channel has to convey syntactic information. Uh, I'm doing new experiments that are promising in this line of research, but ideally you would find the correlate of neurosyntax, that is, the, the electric correlates in the what sense, not in the where sense, of what matters for syntactic computation. Uh, of course, uh, you can have practical application of these results. You can, this is what can be used to help patients with language impairment, for example, anartria or anartria. I don't know how you say that in English, but it's the, you know, the fact that you cannot control the peripheric muscle to produce sound, then you could get the sound, in, in fact, from the brain. But, or it can be used to access verbal thoughts people do not want to reveal. You know, it's the usual Jekyll Hyde problem. That is, uh, if you invent a knife, you can cut bread with that knife, or you can cut your brother's who's cutting bread. He's a recursive knife. Um, but it's interesting, um, one of the things that I learned uh, from Chomsky's classes is that a theory is interesting when it allows you to produce new questions rather than answers. So I tried to list some of the questions that this finding uh, raised, and I hope to share them with you. Uh, the questions are different for type and, um, in, and, you know, and, and weight, I'd say. First, why are phonetic representation present during inner speech? Second, why are phonetic representation present in non-acoustic areas? Third, what does a born deaf person's brain language network generate during inner speech? In fact, the mention that Rini was making to schizophrenic deaf-born patients, um, it's very interesting because it's, they report uh, um, phonetic hallucination. Another question is what happens during dreaming? although we have to make sure that this is compatible with Alan Hobson's um, consideration on uh, dreaming as an aphasic, um, as a non-linguistic uh, fact. Fourth, fifth, do animals have inner speech? They don't have grammar, but do they have a representation of what they produce? Primates, for example. Um, sixth, how does the presence of sound representation influence the architecture of grammar? And we go more into the question you know, pertaining to linguistics. Seven, how does the oscillatory nature of the physical signal language, um, uh, it, how does the oscillatory nature of the physical signal language encoding influence formal properties of grammar? Uh, of course, I will not even be able to address them in a clear way, but I would like to highlight two points here before concluding in my last 10 minutes. The first one uh, is a very surprising convergence. With, there is a kind of a recent paper by Richard Kane that had wanted to explain why in English you cannot say go it as opposed to went. And it's obviously a very interesting paper that tries to argue against the idea that it's a conventional fact or uh, something that is all, also historically accidental. But listen, and so the paper is very interesting and complicated, but I highlighted two points of the paper the first one is the following. Just read the, the red part. There is and can be just one single merge engine. That is, that bottom to top bare phrase structure type derivation, as in Chomsky 1995, 24, page 249, must in fact start with phonological features continuing on up through the phonology and only then reach the syntax. And the conclusion of Rich's paper is astonishing. Phonology fits syntax and should not be factored, factored out of it. I'm aware of the fact that, I mean, 
I am the last person to be able to uh, judge this conclusion here. But still, I find the convergence between the fact that you already have phonological representation in Broca's area, even if you do not externalize. And that is, has to be present at the very moment that you think about words and you compose syntax. Uh, obtains an in, a completely indirect uh, convergence with something that has to do to explaining a morphological fact. And so this is perhaps one of the signal that um, the transformation, that what neurolinguistic will be in the future, of course, um, I'm already, I'm just quoting uh, Chomsky's view as to what happened to physics, will, will not be similar to what is linguistics now, nor to what is neuro, neurology now. It has to change some way. And perhaps this convergence is, a pos is an interesting signal that something is going on that way. The second point that I would like you to, hide out, to, to highlight is the sound meaning mapping. Um, of course, we know that sound and meaning are not necessarily mapped because we have sign language. But on the other hand, there is a preference between that kind of mapping. But let me read another citation. I don't give you the exact date because it's interesting to try to figure out when it was written. With the nerves of vision and of hearing severed and then crossed with each other, we should with the eye hear the lightning flash as a thunderclap, and with the ear we should see the thunder as a series of luminous impressions. This was Henri de Bois-Raymond in 1874. And actually, when I read that, that made me better understand something that um, Chomsky wrote in um, the, the Managua Lectures. The information provided by lexical items and other expressions ills perspectives for thinking and speaking about the world by virtue of the way their, element, their elements are interpreted at the interface, embedded in different performance systems in some hypothetical, perhaps biological, impossible organism, they could serve for some other activity, say locomotion. So Dubois Raymond and this uh, uh, interpretation of you know, possible rewiring makes it clear that it's a question of interpreting different systems. They may have different um, um, uh, origin from a genetic point of view in the individual or in the species. And coming to, in fact, this last question, it is how do we understand the structure of what we have? Uh, I would like to defend a position that uh, we defended together. Your uh, Rini, uh, last name is Miss Print over here. They came out in Trends in Cognitive Science. Um, there is no denying that language is sometimes used to communicate. However, this should not lead to the apparently common fallacy that the design of language can be inferred reverse engineering style from the single functional perspective. If anything, this work that dissociates, uh, um, I mean, anything that makes the representation of sound something that is disconnected from communication, since it is also permitted when you do not have to communicate, reinforces this thing. Shall we ever understand the reason of Babel, the reason of why we are wired that way? I think that, uh, just to have one last uh, remark, our situation is similar to the one of the archaeologists of the future, the fine keyboard of computers, of electronic computers only. He will look at the keyboard and read Q-W-E-R-T-Y and ask why, since we already have alphabetic order, we invented such a stupid system. Do we are, are we so sadistic that we want, you know, young people to learn the alphabetic order and then learn the way that, you know, um, uh, keys are put in a keyboard? Well, no, but that's due to the fact that keyboards were invented where when uh, there was no electronic involved, it was just mechanical. So due to the fact that people kept being very fast in writing, certain letters that were associated in alphabetic order uh, produced a crash of the hammer on, on the machine. So some engineer uh, designed a keyboard where the two frequent letters were a distance on the keyboard. Now, maybe the way where designs responds to some older uh, necessity that has been forgotten, or maybe we won't find. But uh, I find it very interesting, and I want to thank you for inviting me here and for sharing that with you. Since we're close to Christmas, I would suggest uh,
this as a possible gift. Thank you. to have to beg the indulgence of the next session for a few minutes. Say that again? Uh, uh, the, the, the director of it all says there's no time for a panel, for which we apologize. Uh, I'll just make a few final <laughs> remarks. Uh, firstly, about QWERTY op. Uh, there's a uh, variant of the keyboard uh, invented by uh, a man named Dvorak which put the uh, vowels on the left side and the consonants on the right side. And this was in the 1930s, and it was shown that people would type on that keyboard with fewer errors and faster typing, and uh, which would have had, at that time, enormous commercial value because many large companies had a basement full of people who were doing nothing but typing up letters sent down from above from the executives. Uh, but it never caught on for the kind of reason that um, uh, Andrea uh, just mentioned. So um, in conclusion, concerning inner experiences, uh, I am reminded of the phrase from the Beatles song, uh, which is about vision, not audition, but I think the moral is the same. What do you see when you turn out the light? I don't know, but I know it's mine. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>